thanks everyone for being here today. It's a real pleasure to be here. As Connie mentioned, it is my first time here in Marshall, Minnesota, and it's uh, uh, definitely a pleasure to be here. President Gorse already mentioned all the um, sacrifices people had made to be here in terms of giving up uh, uh, prep time for finals. But I also know that it's uh, the Wilder playing tonight, and I uh, appreciate you making that sacrifice. But we should be able to get out of here for, the, for, for uh, some of the hockey game. I'm going to kick things off with some basics about the Federal Reserve System and the uh, Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, and with some words about my current thinking about monetary policy. But the plan is for us to spend the bulk of the evening on your questions. Now, I want to make one key point before I start, and it's a very important one. The views I'm going to express today are, or this evening are my own, and they're not necessarily those of others in the Federal Reserve System, including my colleagues in the Federal Open Market Committee, the, the monetary policy making body in the, in the Federal Reserve System. So let me just start off with some basics about the Fed. So I like to tell people the Federal Reserve System or the Fed is a uniquely American institution. Now what do I mean when I, when I say that? Well, relative to its counterparts around the world, the U.S. Central Bank is highly decentralized. So the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 regional reserve banks that along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., make up the Federal Reserve System. So our bank in Minneapolis serves as the headquarters for Federal Reserve System operations in the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve Districts. Uh, and that uh, district is, is large in terms of area. It includes the state of Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, northwestern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Eight times per year, the FOMC meets to determine the appropriate stance on monetary policy. So I'm not going to talk right now, give you too many details of what I mean by stance on monetary policy. I'm sure we'll get into it when we get into the questions. But let me say a little bit about how these meetings work. All 12 presidents of the various uh, regional Federal Reserve Banks, including me, and the governors of the Federal Reserve Board, contribute to these deliberations. The uh, voters, the, the voting members of the committee uh, actually change from year to year though. Uh, it, the permanent members who always vote each year are the governors uh, in, Federal, in Washington, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and a rotating group of four other presidents. I was on that rotating group of four other presidents last year, but this year I'm a, a non-voter. Now, in this way, the structure of the FOMC mirrors the federal structure of our government because representatives of, uh, from different regions of the country, the various presidents, have input into FOMC deliberations. So one key aspect of that input that we, is information that we gather through our staffs, but also through our personal interactions with community and business leaders uh, all over our districts. So one example of this is that tomorrow morning, uh, our Great Lakes Advisory Council will be meeting um, at Schwann's. And this is a group of people who are from uh, all over the, uh, Minnesota, northwestern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. They'll be joining us here in Marshall to provide uh, my, myself and my staff with input in terms of what's going on in their local economies. That will pro help provide a picture that will uh, shape monetary policy uh, decision making in Washington. Now, as I've said at, at its meetings, the FOMC determines the appropriate stance on monetary policy. But what does this word appropriate mean? What is the FOMC seeking to achieve through its monetary policy choices? And the answer to that comes from Congress. Congress has told us what to do. It's charged the FOMC with two objectives, to promote price stability and to promote maximum employment. And the FOMC has interpreted that first goal of promoting price stability to, keep, uh, inf mean, to mean keeping inflation close to 2%. Now, in order to meet these objectives, promoting max employment, promoting price stability, the F FOMC has targeted a Fed funds rate, which is a short-term interbank lending rate, uh, near zero for uh, over six years, really since uh, December 2008. We've kept our tar the target, uh, target for the Fed funds rate uh, near zero. There's been a lot of conversation recently about the desirability of initiating a gradual increase in the Fed funds rate sometime in 2015. Now, how should we think about that, whether it's desirable or not to raise rates in 2015? In my view, the way we should think about that decision, that question, is through the goals of the FOMC. 
So where are we now in terms of those goals? Right now, PC inflation, personal consumption expenditure inflation, is running well below 2%. And my current outlook is that it will continue to do so for several years. Now, based on that outlook, raising the Fed funds rate in 2015 would be inappropriate because it would slow down the recovery inflation back to target. So inflation is below 2%. If we were to raise rates, that would put a drag on the economy, put a drag on prices. It would take us longer to get back to 2%. Now, on the, I've talked about one mandate, promoting price stability. The labor market improved rapidly in 2014, but that one good year certainly does not make up for the several preceding disappointing ones. So the FOMC can best fulfill its congressional mandate of promoting max employment by doing what it can to facilitate further labor market improvement, like we saw in 2014. So again, this consideration, just like the press stability one, argues against raising the Fed funds rate in 2015. So based on my current economic outlook, the FOMC can best achieve its objectives, promoting price stability, promoting max employment, by keeping the Fed funds rate target at its current level during this calendar year. Now, one thing I want to emphasize to you is that this conclusion is fundamentally an optimistic one. The data on inflation and employment show that we could produce and consume more as a country by utilizing more of our available human resources. Monetary policy can and should be used to help to make that desirable outcome happen. Thank you very much for listening, and I now look forward to taking your questions. So the first question. How does monetary policy affect the farm economy in southwestern Minnesota, considering a possible, uh, and, are we, uh, and are we considering a possible increase in interest rates and the value of the U.S. dollar? So this is a great question. You know, it brings home the fact that monetary policy affects the, the economy in a wide range of ways. One thing we've noticed in the past year, for example, is that um, relative tightening of monetary policy, so if, if uh, uh, one country like the United States is beginning to talk about uh, r uh, removing accommodation, actually did remove accommodation last year through, through, uh, by reducing the, the amount of assets we were buying on a monthly basis. And other countries are at the same time are easing monetary policy by, by buying assets like the ECB is or, uh, and, and Japan is. What that, sh that shows up as, um, in one way it affects the economy, I should say, is uh, through uh, variations in the value of the dollar. And last year the dollar appreciated a lot. Um, so one way monetary policy affects the economy, help, it affects the farm economy, it affects all of Americans, is a tighter monetary policy, all else equal, will lead to a, uh, a, a stronger U.S. dollar. That uh, stronger U.S. dollar, but that's one mechanism. That's only one of many mechanisms through which a tightening of monetary policy puts a drag on economic activity. That's the reason you tighten policy, is you want to put a drag on economic activity. Now, that sounds bad. Why would you want it? <laughs> Why would you put an encumbrance right. in the way of economic activity? It's because you don't want prices and inflation to get too high. Uh, we, we're charged with keeping inflation at 2%, and we're trying to, trying to keep, keep, keep it at that. Um, you know, another, another, this is also asked about the value of, let's see. Well, another way that in, low interest rates uh, affects um, uh, farmland is through, through the value of farmland. All else equal, when interest rates are low, that tends to drive asset, uh, uh, will make asset values higher, like, like uh, farmland. Um, my ears seem to be the wrong shape for this. <laughs> um, so the, uh, you know, the, but you know, I, I, it should be clear, monetary policy is only one um, uh, influence on the American economy, one influence on the, on, on, farm, on, on, on the farm economy, on the agricultural economy. But it is, I think it's important for us to be thinking through all these various channels through which our policy decisions affect the, the economy. But the basic mechanisms are that when we uh, try to tighten policy by, by say, by talking about by raising Fed fund, the Fed funds rate, or even talking about the Fed funds rate, that tends to um, push up on the value of the dollar, that makes, our, makes it, uh, our goods more expensive for others and other countries to buy, that will put a drag on the U.S. economy. But presumably that's because that's what we're trying to do. Okay. And so then another question is, and this is a little bit of a skeptical kind of question, but can sure. the Fed actually 
control the inflation rate with any reasonable accuracy? You know, the data says yes to that. So if we go back over the period, say, from uh, the, late, the mid 1990s through um, about, I would say, 2007, 2008, 2009, maybe 2007, where you, you do see that inflation is being kept very close to 2%. Mm -hmm. We have struggled recently with this. Um, inflation has been running uh, below 2% uh, for, for quite some time now, really going back to um, uh, 2007. I, I keep coming back to that year 2007. That's because that's when the Great Recession is usually did is having started is at the end of 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and inflation has been running below 2% pretty much since then. One year, it ticked up above 2% because oil prices uh, went up in 2011, and, um, and, and, and inflation went up at that time. But every other year since 2007, it's been running below 2%. That's a long time for us not to be able to hit our target. And so it's natural for the questioner to begin to think, well, maybe we can't hit that target. The challenge for us is that um, our natural tool um, the, Fed, the, target, the Fed funds rate, the short-term interbank lending rate, we pushed it down as far as we could, basically close to zero in uh, late 2008. And then we were substituting with other tools, um, asset purchase programs, buying assets. Those were effective, but not as good as what we would have liked to be able to do, which is lower rates further. The fact we couldn't provide as much stimulus, as much accommodation as we would have liked, uh, is why we were, have not been able to hit our inflation target. As the economy improves, um, I think our, our, uh, um, the, the interest rate that we need to, to, to hit in order to get to our target will, will, will go up. And so um, we'll be able to, to, again, be able to hit our 2% inflation target. The challenge is that uh, uh, our tool, tools have not been as effective uh, in the last six years because uh, the natural tool you would use, is the, the Fed funds rate, has been uh, stuck too high. We would have liked to make it lower. We could not do that. So what's magical about 2%? Great this is my question. No, that's a great question. That's the exact... The, no, you, you were paying attention after all that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. So 2% um, weighs off um, you know, a couple of different considerations. So first of all, high inflation is bad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it makes people... Uh, it creates uncertainties about what prices are going to be. Um, it's just a, it's a tax on people's uh, um, holdings of cash. So high inflation is, is, a, is, a, is a problem for the economy. On the other hand, low inflation is also a problem. And wh why is that? Uh, that's because of exactly what we just talked about. If we keep inflation, suppose we were targeting a 1% inflation rate, well, instead of 2, that would mean the long-term interest rates, over the long-term interest rates would be lower as well mm -hmm. because you, interest rates... Uh, one part of it is they're compensating you for the inflation rate. So if we lower inflation, we're going to lower interest rates as well. Oh, well, we just talked about, boy, we want to have some capacity to lower interest rates in order to, uh, to, 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 to buffer the economy against shocks, adverse shocks. Um, so if we lowered it, we'd have less of that, that capacity. So that the, the decision that was made by the committee in January 2012 was, when we did this balancing act between these two considerations, high inflation is bad. On the other hand, we need capacity to help um, buffer the economy at shocks. Uh, we ended up at 2%. Um, you know, one of my, uh, uh, this, I should add that this is pretty close to where most central banks have ended up is at around at, at 2%. Uh, the Bank of England has a 2% target. Um, uh, the Bank of Canada does. Uh, the European Central Bank is targeting 2% or a little under, something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to forget the exact terminology they use. It's pretty consistent with where, where other central banks have ended up on that. So here's another one. This, is, this was not submitted. This is from me as well. And this is from the Wall Street Journal. A couple weeks ago, there was an article about um, the Fed and how it's shying away from the June rate hike and that the subhead is weak economic data causing some officials to rethink timing of the first increase in over six years. Um, what do you think about that? And what, what would you, what are your, a number of your peers are quoted in here as is Chairman Yellen and so on and so forth, Chair Yellen. Yeah, no, th I think uh, this is exactly uh, gets to um, the kinds of conversation that I was pointing to in my, my opening yeah. remarks. I think you know, we have two mandates. We have the mandate to promote price stability, and we have the mandate to promote max employment. Uh, 
I think that inflation has been running low for a long time. My outlook for inflation is, is that it will continue to run low. In order for us to, to get back to 2%, uh, raising rates is going to move us in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. It's going to move the economy in the wrong direction. Now, I think what was true in 2014, as I, I mentioned, is that we had a very strong uh, year from the point of view of the labor market, a very uh, good improvement in the, labor, in the labor market metrics. The first quarter of 2015, though, boy, that's, uh, you know, it's only one quarter, and you don't make po policy based on three months of data, but it is uh, a, a matter for concern. Um, you know, we just got numbers in today from uh, international trade, and you know, once those are folded into the estimates for real gross domestic product, we're probably going to be in a negative situation in the first quarter, meaning that gro real gross domestic product actually contracted in the first quarter. So I think uh, I have emphasized really for um, at least a year, probably longer than that, that, boy, the inflation outlook makes me concerned about raising rates any time in the near, near future. Now I think uh, the softening of what we see on the first quarter in terms of on the ac economic activity front, how much output is being produced, that should give us additional pause for, mm -hmm. for, for uh, uh, instituting a near-term near -term increase. I, I, I would say, though, and you know, I don't speak, as I meant, as emphasized, I don't speak for anybody but myself here, but uh, my, my perspective that um, um, interest rates that we should, uh, I articulate the perspective that based on my economic outlook, we should defer an initial increase in interest rates till uh, uh, 2016, so not in this calendar year. Um, if you look at the FOMC's uh, summary of economic projections, which came out in March, so it's a little bit of time ago, it's a little stale. We don't know, you know, that's, that's from that meeting. But with that said, at that meeting, uh, 15 of the 17 participants uh, said that they uh, projected that the initial it would be appropriate to raise interest rates in uh, in 2015. Hmm. So the my perspective that we should not is in the minority in that in, uh, according to that that summary of economic projections. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Question that was submitted uh, electronically was, what do the Federal Reserve's large scale asset purchases include? And how does the Federal Reserve earn the majority of its income? Oh, um, well, that changes, uh, it's changed a lot in the last few years. So beginning in uh, the latter part of 2008, as I described, just described, uh, we, we uh, lowered, the, the FOMC had lowered the target range for the Fed funds rate uh, down to essentially zero by uh, the end of 2008. But the economy still needed help. Uh, if you remember the, the very dark days at the beginning of 2009, uh, economy shedding jobs at a very alarming rate. So the economy clearly needed help. So what the, the FOMC proceeded to do was buy long-term securities to, in order to put downward pressure on long-term interest rates. So if you buy assets, long-term assets, it's, that's going to make uh, the, the, their prices go up and their yields go down. And, the idea behind that is that if the yields that people can earn, you know, long-term interest rates that people can earn in uh, the marketplace go down, that will stimulate uh, their desire to spend. They'll stimulate the desire of business to invest and hire. So that, that was the, the, the plan behind that. So the questioner asked about what were the assets that we were buying. Uh, we're buying um, long-term assets issued by the Treasury or by gov the government-sponsored enterprises Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that were are, are essentially backed by the government since the end of 2008. And so uh, we have uh, both long-term treasuries, long-term debt issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I, I think some other government-sponsored enterprises, but bulk of it are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then, um, and then also uh, mortgage-backed securities that have been issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as well. Um, there are very strict restrictions on what the federal the FOMC can buy. Um, basically, treasuries and uh, uh, instruments that have been issued by government-sponsored enterprises. Um, and then the question asks how we're making money. Mm -hmm. Well, we have um, bought a lot of long-term assets. Those assets are paying off a coupon. <laughs> um, so if you buy a treasury bond, mm -hmm. uh, just, you, if you go out and buy a 30-year treasury bond, you get coupon payments. We get coupon payments, too. So that's where we, we're, 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 a lot of our income is coming from that. Uh, mortgage-backed securities mature. Uh, we'll get money from that. Um, and 
On the other hand, the interest rate that we're paying to banks who hold deposits with us is very low. It's uh, 25 basis points, which is a quarter of a percentage point, which is low. So that gap allows us to, uh, to, to, to make money. And we made a lot of money last year. We returned $100 billion to the US Treasury last year. But don't get used to it. Because when, uh, when the economy improves, that interest rate we pay to banks will go up. In order, and why does it have to go up? It, it has to go up in order to um, put the kind of uh, breaks on economic activity that we need to keep inflation under control. So once inflation starts to, to rise, we will have to raise rates. When we do that, we'll be paying a higher interest rate to, to our depositors, to our banks. And then that gap I mentioned between what we're getting from our long-term assets and what we're paying to the banks will shrink. And then the, the amount of remittances, the amount we pay to the Treasury will go down. This was part of the plan. We, we, uh, we were taking long-term uh, assets off the marketplace in order to stimulate more investment in long-term projects. And this was exactly going to manifest itself in our earning a lot of money at the beginning and then less later. And it's, pay that's, it's panning out so far? So far, it's looking Go. exactly like as we, we expected, yeah. Good, OK. I'm going to go back to a question that was asked online, and this is about um, farmland. So in which direction do you feel the price per acre will go over the next few years in regard to farmland? This is a very important question for us. Yeah, there's a lot of people in this room who know a yeah, lot more right. about this. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, welcome to my, yeah. <laughs> my position. I'm just kidding. No, no, that's, uh, that's a question that um, is very, very hard to know the answer to. Uh, there's a lot of forces going on in the world that will influence the, uh, the value of uh, agriculture, agricultural land. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the, the impact that uh, interest rate policy would have on it, but that's, that's one of many influences. And so knowing, it, the, being able to predict where uh, this price will go over the longer, over the uh, medium term is, is, is very hard to know. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have anything, I'm afraid I don't have anything more than that to say, except to say it's hard to know. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll hold on to our land. Yeah. <laughs> so here's another one that was presented. Um, do you prefer the study of macroeconomics or microeconomics? And then I would add to this, why? Well, you're not going to catch me on this one either. Oh. <laughs> I like them both. <laughs> so monetary policy is about the study of, is uh, an application of what's typically called macroeconomics. Um, and uh, it's called macroeconomics because it's about the whole economy, macro meaning big. And so we're applying, uh, pl applying what we know to the, the economy as a whole. And, you know, honestly, I got, I got into economics because I was really fascinated by macroeconomics. I, that was what drew me in. I, my freshman year of college, I took a course with uh, Professor Alan Blinder, who was later uh, on the Board of Governors uh, in Washington. And it was a great course, and it fascinated me, and I was, I've always, always liked macro. The reason I say I like them both, though, is that the lines that have between the two areas have really eroded over mm. time. Um, that the, uh, when I was taking Professor Blinder's course, um, really the tools I learned in that course were, they had some similarity too, but were pretty distinct from what I learned in the follow-up course, which is about micro. Now as uh, there's a lot more uh, coherence between the two disciplines, that what, the way macroeconomists think about the macroeconomy really relies a lot on, on microeconomics. And so it's hard to say you like one versus the other. You really need to know them both to be able to, to think effectively about, about, uh, about, about e any, I think about any problem. Yeah. Um, you know, if I, one example I'll give of this is um, one of our mandates is to promote maximum employment. Mm -hmm. um, you really have to know uh, or have staff who can help you with understanding the labor economy. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, in labor markets, I should say, in order to be able to think about what promoting max employment means. So this is typically called a, um, a microeconomic question, actually. There's a lot of microeconomics that goes into understanding the operational labor markets. But how can you do monetary policy without knowing something about it? So the lines between these two, two areas have just become, I think, are very blurred in my own mind at any rate. All economics is fun. I encourage all y'all to take <laughs> it and learn it. And it affects all of our lives, too, that's, doesn't it? That's for Even sure. Even if you're not paying attention to that class, it affects <laughs> your life. I think we have a question from the back, do we not? Yes, thank you for all the really great 
questions. Uh, Mariana, someone asks, uh, mentions that you've talked a fair amount about the inflation target, so please talk more about the target for maximum employment and which target drives Fed policy. So, you know, the target for, for maximum employment is much more challenging and, uh, to, to, to give a quantitative number for. So that Federal Market Committee announced its long-run goals and strategies in uh, January 2012, it gave a hard number for what it was targeting in terms of the inflation rate. And that's because uh, most economists, most macroeconomists, including myself, think that monetary policy is the prime determinant of inflation over the medium and longer term. That's not true for maximum employment. Many influences things affect what we would think of as maximum employment. Um, structural change in, in uh, structural technological change will, will affect that. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the tax system can affect that. So many different kinds of influences on what, what, what will mean max employment. And so what, what we typically try to give is a guide, and here I, here I, we, I mean the Federal Open Market Committee, we'll give a guide to where we expect the economy to converge over the longer run in terms of the unemployment rate. And that is uh, now, right now, in the, the low 5%. Okay, so over the longer mm -hmm. haul, uh, but I, I fr frankly, my own estimate of that has has um, changed over time. It's come down quite a bit over the last couple of years. Um, so my, my estimate was over six percent, and now it's down at, down at five. Um, and you know, I'm continuing to rethink that estimate. Um, now, what makes me what makes you rethink that? Why would you reconsider it? It's because you're trying to figure out where the unemployment rate can go and still hit your two percent inflation target. Because that's what defines where we can go in the long run with max employment. The two, two, the two goals actually work together in that way. That what do we mean by max employment? It's where how much employment we can have without generating too much inflation. Now the, the question I asked, what drives Fed policy? Well, our long run goal statement I think puts it well by pointing out that most of the time, these two uh, objectives are are complementary with one another. And the reason for that is most shocks that come along drive tend to push down on prices of employment and together, or push up on prices of employment at the same time. And we, by monetary policy, does the same thing. Uh, by tightening policy, we will push down on prices of employment, so we can offset shocks that are moving them up. Or um, the, the, uh, by, by easing policy, we'll push up on prices of employment and, and go in the opposite direction. Uh, then offset shocks that are moving the opposite direction. The last a few years have been a great example of this. Both prices and employment have been running too low. And so policy uh, is really trying to be achieved both objectives at the same time. There's not been any tension between the two of them. You know, I, I think in principle you could imagine occasions when um, if you were trying to tighten policy so as to bring inflation down, if inflation was running above 2% and you had to bring, it da bring inflation down, um, you know, that would be repre might represent a tension then between the two objectives. How fast should you do that without violating, uh, without, with, in, how fast would you want to do that so that you, you were not uh, uh, creating too much unemployment? Okay? If you tighten policy, you're going to lower employment, create unemployment. But we're not in that situation. And we haven't been in that situation for, for uh, uh, since I've been president. The ten there's not been a tension between the two objectives whatsoever. So we're, we're trying to do them both at the same time, and we can. Okay, thank you. We're going to jump to a question on, um, it relates to interest rates for students, okay? Uh, so why does the government charge a higher interest rate, higher rate of interest for students, I think student loans, than it does when it lends money to banks? After the financial crisis of 2007-8, it seems that risk cannot be a real factor. It's one of the questions that was submitted. Yeah, so... This is an interesting question. I mean, so the, um, we, by the government here, I'm going to talk about uh, a particular kind of program, which is what's called the, uh, the, the discount window. And this is a, uh, a facility that the, the Federal Reserve runs, in fact, that allows um, banks to come and borrow on an on a overnight basis from, from, uh, um, from us. The, um, Interest rate on those loans is uh, currently at less than a, a percentage point, 
but very little lending actually takes place. I'm not going to get the exact number right at this point, but very, uh, very few loans are actually taking place, um, even at that low interest rate. Uh, whereas, of course, students are paying a much higher rate for their loans. Um, what, 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 what's, what's the, we are, um, the, the loans we, we make to banks are, uh, we have to, they have to be safe. They have to be fully collateralized. We have to be backed by a, nor we are not taking any risks when we, we, we make loans to, to, to financial institutions. The, the proof of that is we've never lost a penny on these loans. So that's our thinking on that. Uh, now, I'm not going to speak for, for uh, lenders to, to students and what they're thinking through. But in general, differences in returns across different projects and uh, different bonds and are, are, are driven by risk considerations. And that uh, these kinds of, uh, presumably these kinds of loans are going to carry more risk than the, the loans I just mentioned that we're making through the discount window. OK. Thank you. But you don't you don't find that compelling? Well, um, so the loans that are made to students are riskier than to the banks. Why why would they be so much riskier? Yeah, this is I truly mean, from me. So I mean, that, that in ter terms of the banks, I mean, I, as I've talked about th through this one program that we have, mm -hmm. the discount window uh, program, we we just literally have not lost a dollar on that ever. I you know I I. I I don't know the ins and outs of uh, student loan programs, but I, I, I doubt that, that lenders feel that same degree of confidence in, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. every loan they make in that program. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Okay. Yep. We have many, many questions. I'm going to do Good. a bit of a mashup here. Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the wage gap and on whether and why, if it is uh, getting worse, and how does Fed policy affect in income inequality? So the the wage gap, referring to inequality in wages. I think or? so. Yeah, income inequality in both cases. Okay. I think the best way that the Federal Reserve can uh, offset. The, I'll back up for a second, which is. You know, income inequality is not one of our objectives, right? Our objectives are to promote max employment and promote price stability. So we, we don't target some level of income inequality. That's not what, what our job is. Our job is to promote max employment, promote price stability, to use the goals that have been given to us by Congress in order to do that. With that said, I, I think the best thing that we can do, um, get, I think our goals are completely consistent with uh, trying, to, uh, trying to ameliorate inequality. In the sense that if we had a higher demand economy, there'd be more demand for workers, more demand for, for uh, uh, that would re re redu generate more jobs, but also generate higher wages for those jobs. Uh, wage growth has been very low, uh, running very low since the uh, end of the Great Recession um, in, in uh, mid-2009. Uh, that low wage growth manifests itself as well, I think, in low inflation. Uh, these are all signs that um, we're, we're uh, not generating enough demand for resources in the economy, and more stimulative monetary policy can be helpful on that. Uh, can be can can, can uh, help on that, that that issue. You know that. So as I say, our goals are not specifically tied to income inequality, but I think promoting max employment can be very helpful in terms of ameliorating some of the inequality we see in the, in the U.S. So how do your goals get set? Uh, that's uh, set by said, uh, in the Federal Reserve Act by Congress. So promoting max employment, promoting price stability uh, is uh, in the Federal Reserve Act. Now those words, promoting price stability, promoting max employment, those are words. Mm -hmm. So then, how do you make that quantitative? Uh, you know, the Federal Open Market Committee has translated the uh, the price stability goal uh, into keeping inflation at two percent. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So uh, in that they were set by Congress, how? Um do they ever re-examine those and decide to have different priorities? No, I think there's ongoing conversations about those issues even as we speak. Um, you know, some, uh, I certainly had questioners in the past ask me, uh, wouldn't we have a better policy if we only had a single mandate? Mm -hmm. You know, always if you have two goals, actually we already had a question about uh, potential conflicts between the goals. You always worry if you have you know, too many objectives, you start to run into the conflicts across those objectives. Um, so those kinds of conversations, I, I think, 
uh, you know, you'll, you'll see proposals along those lines get made. Um, you know, that's, that's Congress's role, is to think about those, those kinds of issues, and that's who, that's who can set our priorities for us. Uh, as an economist, I, you know, I'm per, very comfortable with our two objective system. I think that uh, most central banks who have an explicit inflation target um, will usually be peeking over their shoulder as, as anyways of what's going on with the real economy. And that will guide how quickly they want to get back to target. So uh, if you're running inflation above 2%, uh, the fact that you're concerned about the real economy will lead you to take maybe longer to get back to 2% than, than okay. as fast as you can. I think we're very open about that process by having a dual mandate. I think that makes it clear that we're going to be looking at both employment and inflation making our decisions. But okay. yeah, but these these uh, these are objectives set by Congress, and like everything else set by Congress, you know, there's, it, it could change if, if Congress decides. How long to. have they been in effect? How long have they been the goals? Um, I think explicitly since the late '70s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Humphrey Hawkins Act. So. Okay. Okay. So here is a little bit longer question that was submitted earlier. Okay. When we think about the bailout bailout of the financial sector in 2008. Would it have been possible to recapitalize the banks from the bottom up instead of the top down? That this is again. That is, could the government have paid down mortgages by 40% up to say 100,000, and made a deposit into a special account for renters? To this is getting lots of detail here, but and made a deposit into a special account for renters to pay 24 months of rent, say up to 50,000. Assuming you got the right amount of recapitalization. Would this have had the same effect at stabilizing the economy as giving the money to the banks at the top? So uh, this is obviously a question that's very rich. <laughs> and um, so I'll say a couple things about it. I, I think that the, the fa situation that was being faced in late 2008 was in a very much an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. I think there was a concern that uh, massive amounts of funds could be withdrawn in a very short period of time from the financial system, leading to uh, basically real tightening of the basic plumbing of, I managed to mix two metaphors there, but uh, basically really causing, I think, uh, real problems for the financial system. Uh, people talk about the collapse of the financial system. I, 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 I think that's, I don't like such uh, uh, exaggerated language myself, but it would have created enormous strains in our financial system if we'd had um, continued to see the kind of outflow of funds that we were seeing the first part of September of 2008 had continued onwards. I, I think a necessary condition for uh, keeping the U.S. economy, even in the, you know, certainly things went very poorly. Uh, unemployment went up to 10 percent um, by, mm -hmm. by uh, the latter part of 2009. But things would have been much worse had um, the banking system collapsed. Mm -hmm. And I think the Federal Reserve and, and other parts of the government, uh, I think, did some uh, very important work in a very fast uh, uh, period of time in order to keep that financial system afloat. It was really, to use a technical term, it was a necessary condition for us to keep the economy going. To, now, it wasn't sufficient. <laughs> what I mean by that is we still had unemployment at 10%. Mm -hmm. And what this question we ask is a great question. Would there, could there have done, could, we, could, could something else have been done? Mm -hmm. Could Congress, instead of passing TARP, the uh, Troubled Asset Relief Plan in, in uh, the fall of 2008, could it have done something along these lines instead? I think it's a great question for future research, frankly. You know, we might, we or some other country might face this same kind of challenge again. Mm -hmm. And you, what you want at that point is to be able to open a textbook and say, okay, here's what we do in these situations. Um, but the realized wisdom in, among economists, and, and uh, Chairman Bernanke, was, who was the chair of the Federal Reserve System at the time, was one of the great scholars on this, was you have to keep the banking system going. Otherwise, you're going to have um, not just 10% unemployment, but 20% unemployment and higher. And um, this, this individual poses a, a different approach. I think it's, it's, this is something that requires study, thought, and maybe it'll enter into the textbook and playbook next time around. Okay, good. Thank you. How, here's another one back to, um, back to our environment where we are at this very moment, a university setting. It's another question that had been asked in advance. Do you see a continuous rise in costs 
for a college education as there have been in previous years? Do you think that pricing for schooling will ever go, go down, and how would this be achieved? And I'm fascinated by, by this question. <laughs> so in, I, I had, it actually wasn't, it wasn't motivated by this question. I had been looking at uh, um, tuition here in Minnesota mm -hmm. um, for the University of Minnesota, I, 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 not for the, for the for Southwest State in particular, but for the, for the flagship okay. campus in the uh, University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Actually, for the last three years, um, tuition's been fixed. So it hasn't gone down, but it has been, has been fixed. Um, but I think the questioner is pointing to the fact that tuition had been rising very rapidly for over a mm -hmm. period of time. Um, I, you know, I think that that's going to be a, an ongoing give and take about how we think about um, uh, financing college education mm -hmm. in this country. Uh, not just Minnesota, but many states, I think, went to a model that was more um, focused on, less on, uh, on uh, transfers from the state to the university and more based on tuition mm -hmm. as a, a model and then uh, basically financing them being driven by, by students taking on debt as we've, we've talked about already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's very worthwhile to have a, con uh, a conversation about whether that was the right decision slash approach to take. Um, contemporaneous with that, you can't argue causation, but you can point to contemporaneous with that, um, our rate of educational growth rate of educational attainment has slowed. So if you look up until 1990, say 1970, 1990, we, our rate of educational attainment, how many people were getting college degrees, was growing much more rapidly than it did after that. And um, as a result of that, we've started, we were pretty much at the top in 1990. We've really started a slip and slide relative to other countries. I think it's a very interesting question to what extent the way we've chosen to finance um, student education, mm -hmm. um, how much that plays into that, into that change in the growth rate of educational attainment, and you know, w whether that's the right model then, uh, given the results of that. In the 80s, there was a real shift in, um, in, uh, at the federal level even, in support for education too, and it went from uh, grants to self-help loans and work study and so on. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and there's reasons why you'd want to do that, but it, at the same time, it's obviously going to be I think it's obvious that um, it, it's mm -hmm. a deterrent for, for people to go mm -hmm. to college. Yeah. And so um, I think it's something that, that's probably worth thinking about and, and, and uh, figuring out whether or not this was the right, 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 right approach that we were talking through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. Another one. Do you have another question back there? We have very many questions. Okay. Uh, nice job. So here's one. Holding rates low for so long discourages household saving. What would you say to someone who is attempting to build individual wealth? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's um, let me say a couple things about that. First of all, it's, it's a fact. I mean, that, that I've talked about our promoting our objectives by, by keeping rates low, uh, promoting max employment, promoting price stability. That's what we're charged to do. And that's why we keep rates low. Uh, it, but, you know, this is a policy that I, does help everybody by promoting max employment, promoting price stability. But it helps some more than others. Um, if you're someone who's trying to save through a, um, especially through short-term liquid assets, if you want to keep a, a pile of money in a bank account and keep it, keep it there in case of emergencies, um, having the Fed keep low interest rates makes that more, uh, you just don't get a, low, low, a high return on that. That's, a, that's definitely a reflection of our policy choice affecting some people differently from others. If you're borrowing, you know, obviously you're, these low rates are, are a good thing, right? Um, with that said, I, I, I do try to encourage people to think through our problem. That is, why are we keeping rates low? We're not keeping rates low because we like low rates. We're keeping low rates, rates low because we're trying to achieve our goals of maximum employment and price stability. And the right question to be thinking about is, why does the Fed have to keep rates low as it does now to achieve its goals and actually fall short of its goals compared to 2007? And I think this is really the, the, uh, the crux of the matter. And the answer to that is everybody wants to save. Everybody around the world wants to save. And it's because of a couple of many different factors running around, I think, that, 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 that are important to understanding is demographic changes around the world. I think the fear factor, 
that in the wake of 2008, yep. when uh, lines of credit dried up, a lot of businesses want to have their own holdings of assets. A lot of uh, households do as well. And then at the same time, regulatory change in the financial sector is asking many financial institutions to hold a lot more financial assets as well. Mm -hmm. This means that if you're trying to save in a world when everyone else is trying to save, you're going to get low, low rates of return on your, on your investments. And that's why, we, that's why we have to keep rates as low as we do to try to achieve our goals as well. OK. The question that was submitted about the minimum wage, OK? So how will the minimum wage increase affect price or production or the amount of jobs? So this is another really great question because um, I talked about going to, going to um, take economics, macroeconomics as a freshman. And uh, this question just illustrates how, how much our, our thinking on these kinds of uh, issues have changed as, as a profession in the last, well, a long time, 35 years. <laughs> um, you know, when I was taught, this wouldn't have been a macro, it would have been a micro. When I was taught about the minimum wage, the way it was taught is there would be a, cur a line going down and a line going up. <laughs> one would be labeled supply, one would be labeled demand. And then there'd be another uh, vertical, a horizontal line, the minimum wage. And you'd see from that that um, you would, you, that would have been a bad thing because you would have created um, um, a, a gap that would be unemployment by, by through that, through that fixing the wage to uh, too high a level relative to where those two, the other two, the demand and supply crossed. And that was pretty much the end of the story. Then in the, uh, the mid-1990s, um, two labor economists, uh, David Card and Alan Kruger, uh, did some very careful empirical work um, that indicated, at least in the, the, cases, the cases they looked at, that the increase in the minimum wage had actually led to an a increase in employment. So the case I described where the two lines crossed and then you drew another uh, horizontal line, that led to a decrease in employment. But they had found that it actually led to, a, to an increase in employment. Now, I think this is a great illustration of, and uh, there's been a lot of follow-up empirical work. Some has found it depends really what instance you look at. Uh, I think all economists agree if you were to set the minimum wage at $150 an hour, you would have lower employment. That's not the issue. The question is, for the size of the minimum increases mm -hmm. that we're talking about, it's more complicated. And so how could it be that increase the minimum wage would increase employment? You know, we, we, we know it's making uh, hiring workers more costly for firms. But in situations where um, firms have a lot of market power in hiring their workers, they may have set the wages sufficiently low that people are, are not willing to work because the wages are so low. And raise the minimum wage actually makes them think, OK, let me go get a job. So in that, those instances, you can actually increase employment by raising the minimum wage. That's just the theory of it. The empirics are, boy, just, it's more uh, nuanced and um, subtle than my picture of the two lines crossing and another, another horizontal line would have uh, led us to believe. So this is a, a very long-winded answer to say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> more study is needed. Yeah. There you go. OK. How about any question from another one from the audience? You made it clear that you don't believe rates should be raised until 2016. What is the argument for raising them that others of your colleagues are making? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, um, I think, a, uh, um, a challenge because, you know, I don't want to speak for them. I don't want them speaking for me, and I don't want to speak for them. But, the many observers beyond my, my colleagues have talked about, boy, it would be, be uh, nice to, to, to raise rates. I think there are two main costs that, that pe concern people about keeping rates low. Um, one is one we've already, I've already talked about, and that is that um, inflation, is, they worry that inflationary pressures will emerge and inflation will go up above 2%. You know, I, why, why would they think that? I think it's because they're relying on a model of inflation called the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve uh, says that as when unemployment falls, that should mean that uh, we'll see upward pressure on, on wages because there are fewer workers looking for work. And firms are going to have a harder hard time finding workers. They'll bid up wages. And that'll also translate into higher price inflation. That's great in theory. Uh, empirically, that hasn't worked that well in the last 15 or 20 years. Um, and my own outlook is shaped by that more recent empirical work that shows that 
you know, the Phillips curve doesn't work that well. And uh, we've just seen uh, the, the model I'm using for forecasting inflation is, boy, inflation has been low for a very long time. It's like a big, it's a very persistent process, which just means it's like a big ship. It takes a long time to turn it. So I, I, that's why I see inflation, it's going to take some time to get back to, to, uh, to 2%. Um, my outlook is 2018, as I mentioned earlier. This is consistent with other forecasts out there. For example, the, the staff at the Federal Reserve Board also have the same outlook for inflation, that it will not, uh, they have it that inflation will not get back to target by 2017. Um, the other risk that people are worried about is that low interest rates will foster excessive risk taking the economy. That'll lead people to make bets um, that they shouldn't. Um, and those excessive risk taking could cause instability in the macro economy. Yeah. Um, and I think this is a risk worth, that's definitely worth keeping our eye on. Uh, there's definitely ways to interpret what happened in the mid-2000s as being that we had an overinvestment in housing. People got overconfident what was going to happen in the housing market, and suddenly it turned south. Um, you know, there's, it's questionable how much of that was due to low interest rate policy, but uh, I've argued in the past that, that, that it started well before low interest rate policy did. But boy, it's something I, I'm sufficiently uh, uh, humble about offering that conclusion to say that, boy, this is something we should keep our eye on. And so we are keeping our eye on it. There's a lot of Federal Reserve staff um, time and energy are spent on trying to keep track of how much risk taking is going on out there. Are we seeing excessive amounts of it? And the answer is right now, it's just not material at this stage. So I think there are two costs we have to keep our eye on, which is our inflation and, mm -hmm. and financial stability. They just don't seem to me, at least, to be, to be material at this point. OK, I'm going to ask you one more question, OK? Sure. How well is the, and this is submitted earlier, how well is the US dollar standing compared to other countries right now? And what is projected for the future of the US dollar? Well, I think that um, the second question answered. The second question is that um, um, projecting what's going to happen with uh, asset prices is very hard. Um, the dollar might go up, it might go down. <laughs> and, you know, that actually turns out to be we've had a lot of different horse races in economics about what forecasts a dollar well. And typically what wins out is what's called the random walk model, which basically mm -hmm. means that where the dollar is today is. Uh, about as good as we can forecast about where it's going to be in the future. Okay. So that's the second piece of the question. The first piece, I, I guess I just have a more neutral view about, about the value of the dollar. Um, I, I guess this, this, I'm not sure what, how well it means, mm -hmm. means, right? If you're an, an exporter, um, generally it's going to be good for you to be able to have the, the dollar be low relative to other currencies in order for you to be able to sell your goods effectively. Uh, if you're an importer, yeah. the opposite. Right. So I don't know which kind of person mm -hmm. this was who sure. was asking this question. Um, what, what did happen uh, last year is uh, the dollar uh, rose very rapidly in, uh, in uh, 2014. Um, I talked about some of the, some of the reasons. I, I think there are many factors, as usual, uh, going into movements of asset prices. But I do think that monetary policy, the differences in monetary policy across different parts of the world played, played a role in that. Um, but it's, uh, the, the value of the dollar right now is, I think, about 10 or 11 percent higher than uh, it was when I became uh, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So. But as I say, that. Uh, the word higher makes people think immediately, oh, that's a good thing. But you know, remember that, uh, that poor exporter out there, too. That's right. So. That's right. Well, you have given us a lot of things to think about. And you've helped educate us in a lot of different ways. And um, you've certainly helped me as well personally. So thank you very much. Let's, uh, please join me in thanking President Kosher Lakota. Thanks for your great questions. Yeah.